Velkommen alle sammen. Kjære hundevenner. Dear Dr. Brenda Bonnet. It's an honor for me as the CEO of the Norwegian Kennel Club to welcome you all to this seminar. This evening you will learn more about one topic that is closest to my heart and that is dog health and dog welfare and I'm sure that's shared by all of you sitting here tonight. At the Norwegian Kennel Club, the continued improvement of dog health and welfare is the driving force and main ambition of all our activities. The breed clubs in Norway are doing a good job when it comes to maintaining the qualities of their breeds. The job in recent years when it comes to outlining breed-specific breeding strategies is a testament to their knowledge, their ambition, and not least, the passion for their dogs. This passion and interest in attaining and using new knowledge is a solid foundation for the future of our breeds. While there are certainly crucial challenges that we together need to tackle, I'm confident that we together will manage to maintain the good dog welfare that, that we have been blessed with here in Norway. I'm sure that you, like myself, are eager to learn more about the trends and developments within dog wealth, health and the various challenges in this area. Tonight, you will be able to learn more about this from one of the most knowledgeable and updated sources. Dr. Brenda Bonnet is the leader of International Partnership for Dogs, a partnership of which the Norwegian Kennel Club is a proud founding member. In collaboration with Agra Pet Insurance, she will no doubt present valuable information to all breed clubs represented here tonight. And I've been told we are at the school and schools have some funny routines. So it's very likely that the screen will turn black at around seven o'clock. <laughs> and we will not panic. We will just reboot and continue. So please do not leave when that happens. You are so welcome, Brenda, and I'm so looking forward to hear you tonight. Thank you very much. And uh, many of you know that uh, this is also being streamed this evening, so welcome to our visitors from Sweden and Denmark and the world, and now I'm going to pretend you're not there <laughs> and just focus on the people that are with me in the room. Uh, is this okay with the lights? Do we need to take some of these lights or you can see okay? Seems all right. Okay. Uh, the title of this talk is not really representative of what I'm going to talk about. As Trina said to you, this is going to be a very broad talk about health, well-being, welfare in dogs with a little bit of a focus on uh, breed profiles and updates from Agria. And because Agria is the sponsor of this talk and because they are one of our greatest partners, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them as we end up getting into some of the data from the Swedish insurance. Agria is one of the oldest and largest animal insurers in the world. Um, they have been active in Sweden for, I think actually now it's 128 years maybe. And uh, they are very important in the pet industries in Sweden and Norway, also in Denmark and just recently started in Finland and as well in the UK under animal pet insurance. One of the greatest things about them is that they have been developed from the Agria concept, which says you must partner with the important other stakeholders in dog health or animal health and well-being. And so the pet insurance is all done together with uh, kennel clubs in the countries in which they work. And that leads to some exciting information coming out. So we'll be talking about that as we move forward. So part of what I'm going to present today is Agria breed data. And some of you 
have seen it before because some of the Norwegian clubs have included Agria data in their uh, RAS documents. Um, how many of you have seen uh, data from the Swedish insurance company in your work with breed clubs? Uh, about, well, quite many, 25 people, maybe something like that. And maybe I'll back up and say, how many of you are dog breeders? For those of you at home who cannot see, it's almost everybody. How many of you are members of your breed club health committee or executive? Also very many. How many of you are veterinarians? Wow, a lot. Veterinary students, did you put your hands up when I said that? Oh, a few more of those. And veterinary technicians or nurses as well, okay. And of course, what I see with this a lot too is that many of you wear more than one hat, if I would say hat is the right word to, to use. Many of you are both a veterinarian and a breeder or you're on a breed club and you're a vet tech. And that's the world of dogs, that people are often in more than one place at one time. And uh, it makes it very rich, but sometimes we see with different eyes depending on which hat we're wearing. I should have asked, how many of you are dog judges? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Six or seven or eight or so, okay. We'll see if we can pick on you a little bit tonight as we go. <laughs> so I will be talking about Agria breed data. I will also be talking about the International Partnership for Dogs and our web platform, dogwellnet.com. Back to Agria and Agria breed data for a moment. Um, I want to cover a little bit of the background, where those data come from and how we use them. It's data on veterinary care events. You understand, of course, that dogs go to the veterinarian sometimes many times, sometimes for something small, sometimes for something major. And a veterinary care event, as we define it, is something where the cost comes above the deductible, or in Swedish it's risk. in Norwegian it's something like that. And, um, but as my breeder friends tell me, veterinary care is not cheap. So it's not hard to come above that self-risk when you take your dog to the vet. And then that comes into our statistics. We also uh, look at life insurance or death statistics, and we'll have a little bit of that later. But mostly I want to discuss how these breed statistics have been incorporated into looking at the health of breeds with some specific examples. One of the things we stress when we talk to the breed clubs about using the breed statistics from the insurance is that this isn't the final word. It's just one of the words. You know a lot about your breed. You've been collecting data on the health in your breed for a long time. Most breed clubs have done some sort of a health survey. And uh, from all of this, you've started to collect evidence. And then you have research findings. Uh, researchers have done work perhaps on diseases in your breed. So the idea is that we have to nowadays go out and find all the available sources of information and evidence from experts, which could be other breeders or veterinarians or researchers, and we pull all that information together and we assess its strengths and weaknesses. Because although it's become a lot easier to find information now that we have the internet, it is, you may not know this, it is actually possible to find information on the internet that is actually wrong. Now, if you've ever experienced that, I'm telling you, it's theoretically possible. The International Partnership for Dogs and dogwellnet.com, I'll also cover the sort of who, what, and why of that organization, focus on Norway's role, talk a little bit about some hot topics we've been dealing with, and then talk about breed information and you, and that will relate mostly to the breed club and breeder people, but it could also be the veterinarians and everybody else in the room. So why has this come about? So I told you that the Augury Insurance Company has been around for a long, long time, 
And the Swedish Kennel Club has been around for 125 years or 126 years now. And the Norwegian Kennel Club, how aged are you? About the same. So there's, it's been going on for a long time. The Swedish Kennel Club has a big focus on responsible dog ownership, and they have high expectations of their breeders and breed clubs. Some of this is a focus on information sharing and this demand that every breed club do a RAS AVIL strategy, a breed-specific breeding strategy. And in Sweden, all of the clubs, all of the breeds for which there is uh, insurance information, which is right now about 130 breeds, they must include a discussion of that information in the Ross Avel strategy and compare it to other information and talk about what it means. The other background in the Swedish Kennel Club is that they have a very strong affiliation between the Kennel Club, the university, the veterinary faculty. There's a lot of collaboration on research and programs. So with the insurance company and the SKK, this is why this started in Sweden. But couldn't we say the same thing about Norway? Couldn't we say basically the same things about the Norwegian Kennel Club with the focus on dog, uh, uh, responsible dog ownership, both in the purebred and outside the purebred world? And you, the breeds here all do a RAS, although they don't all incorporate the Swedish data. And of course, you have this strong affiliation. So these characteristics exist here in Norway, as well as in Sweden, and really also in Finland. Well, what's special about the Agri insurance in Sweden is that they cover a large proportion of the Swedish dog population over many decades. So the insurance base there is quite stable. They also cover a large proportion of uh, horses and cats. The key thing for me as a researcher when I first came to Sweden was that the insurance company had this database full of information and they were willing to share it uh, with me and with other researchers. And coming from North America, that was a very foreign concept for me. They started to think I had a problem because about every 10 minutes I'd say, I don't think I understand. You have this whole company database and you're just going to give it to me. <laughs> yes. I'm okay. And then 10 minutes later I'd be, no, I must be missing something here. <laughs> and so the great thing was that, uh, and so the Swedes finally said to me, what would be the point of having all these data if we didn't share them? And I said, of course you're right and this is not the way it is in North America. So. I have been coming to Scandinavia now for 20 some years and very happy to keep coming. And on top of the willingness to share, I'm thinking maybe this is going to be hard to see. They even paid for the development of it. They have the Agria SKK Research Fund and they funded a lot of this work. So, and that wouldn't happen in North America either, so that's a great thing. And 125 years history. So it's that willingness to share and to fund and support the research that's done that was really special in Sweden at the time. So it was Agri Animal Assurance, it was researchers from the Swedish University of Agricultural Science, the Veterinary College in Sweden. I was at the time on faculty at the University of Guelph in Canada, and of course the Sweden, Swedish Kennel Club. And the big picture there is partnership. It's not that anyone of those organizations was key, they were all key. The idea was we were working together to make things happen. And then when we come to the breed statistics from Agria, probably what makes them work the most is it wasn't the researchers or the university or the insurance company saying, you breeders, you better look at these numbers. These numbers were demanded by the breed clubs. They said, you're this big insurance company, you're collecting all this information on health problems in our breeds, we want to know, we really want to know. And so with that demand, it pushed us on. And then, yes, there have been one or two breed clubs who needed a little extra convincing, I could say. But in general, the breed clubs were eager for the information and wanted to look at them. 
A little bit about me, some of you have seen me before and some of you uh, know a bit about my background. I am a veterinarian. I graduated um, several millennia ago and was in private practice for some time and I started to specialize in reproduction and did a lot of work with breeders and eventually went on to do a PhD in epidemiology and focus on population issues all species, but then eventually mostly on companion animals. As I said, I've been coming to Sweden since 1994. I was eight years old when I started. <laughs> and um, in addition to the population and companion animal health side of things, I've done a lot of work in human-animal interactions, veterinary communication, and animal welfare partly through the grad students I've worked with both in Canada and Scandinavia. Uh, and it's, I guess, my broad background that helps me see these big pictures and, and bring them together. And my interest and ability in working with a lot of different groups. So now uh, I am CEO of the International Partnership for Dogs and DogWellNet.com. And this is a somewhat older picture of me with an absolutely stunning Ridgeback that was not mine. She was a Swedish uh, Ridgeback, but I did um, own Ridgebacks at one time and bred one litter of dogs, so I'm totally a breeder. <laughs> and, um, and actually, one of the welfare uh, meetings that I was at, one of my co-speakers was talking about defining commercial breeders, and he said, in his opinion, a commercial breeder who was, uh, was anyone who had ever sold a puppy for money. So I'm also a commercial breeder, as I assume many of you in the ar ar audience are as well. We will come back to that later. So the International Partnership for Dogs is this organization that came together with a mission to enhance the health, well-being, and welfare of purebred dogs and all dogs and to enrich human-dog interactions. Our founding and initiating partners were the National Kennel Clubs of Sweden and Finland, Norway, the Scandinavian Clubs, France, Germany, um, Ireland is in with us, and uh, the Kennel Club in the UK has been one of the founders with us from the beginning. The American Kennel Club joined us just this last December. The OFA, which many of you will know relative to hip dysplasia and uh, elbows, uh, was in with us from the beginning, and of course, the Agria, uh, Agria through the uh, SKK Research Fund. FCI supported much of this work in the very early days and is one of our partners, and we're building a lot of other relationships. This is not meant to be an organization just of kennel clubs, but uh, any relevant um, stakeholders to dog health and well-being. And so we're in discussion with several veterinary organizations who will come in as members and partners and collaborators and various uh, private funds as well. Why did these people feel there was a need to have this new organization? Well, part of the new was this is a sinological or dog organization without a history, without a background, I don't know if you know, but sometimes there's some political things that go on in the dog world. And so this organization is free of all that. We have nothing to do with dog shows other than we work together with a lot of people who uh, go to dog shows and are interested in dog shows and breed dogs that go to dog shows. But we have no primary interest in that. And so all our organizations come together and say, here's a way to focus on dog health and welfare separate from our other missions, separate from our statutes or the rules and regulations we have, we can just focus on that here. And behind this, all these groups said, we have so many needs in common. As kennel clubs, different countries, but so many issues are the same for us. So many of the challenges are the, sh the same. We should work together, we should share our resources both in terms of uh, resources like human resources, information, background. 
And of course, behind it also is the realization that dog breeding is global. How many of you that have bred a dog have ever bred to a dog outside of Norway? Many. Outside of Scandinavia? Many. Uh, USA? Quite a few. Um, so it's becoming global, right? You don't have to ship the whole dog around anymore. You can just ship in the important bits <laughs> as needed. And so it's really a global situation. I'm talking uh, also with an insurance company in Japan. And they're, um, you know, many of the dogs in Japan come from Europe and other areas. So it's a small world, as we would say. This bottom line is really important. Um, Another thing that happens in the world nowadays is sometimes there's media storms and things happen and people want to attack other people for various reasons. There's so much good work being done by our partners, it's most important to get that information out there proactively. Uh, it's many times when I am talking to people about excellent programs in health and they say, but we're doing that. And I say, yeah, but who, knew, who knows? So we need to know, we need to share. And so with Norway and the NKK, uh, and also through your link with the Nordic Kennel Union, we have uh, lots of documents from you. You are a guiding light in terms of ethical guidelines, and uh, NKO has an excellent position paper on use of DNA tests. And we're hoping to get more and more English translations of the RAS documents, at least portions of them, even if it's not the whole thing. And um, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to share your Norwegian RAS with the rest of, rest of the world? I want you to share because I think it's outstanding work. And you've done a lot of work, and I think people will be very interested in it. I believe that the similarities across breeds in different countries are more than the differences, and we can learn maybe as much from the differences as from the similarities. So we want to know about that. So I just pulled one example off the internet of a Norwegian RAS, in, uh, RAS and it's for the German Shepherds. And it's 43 pages long. I suppose there's some that are much shorter and some, a few that are maybe longer. And I know that you have this wonderful template that lays out all the areas you're supposed to cover in your RAS document. How many of you in the room have ever worked on a RAS document? Almost everybody. Wow. How many of you love it and can't wait for the next time? <laughs> oh, I, I couldn't see there to count. I think it was everybody. In Sweden, uh, they have also the RAS specific AVAL strategies. Um, and in uh, Finland, it's called the <laughs> And uh, luckily, they call it the JTO, for those of us who um, are not quite perfect in, in Finnish. Um, and uh, all of you, all three of these Scandinavian uh, clubs, have long templates that help the breed clubs to say, cover the history, cover the health, cover the mentality, what are your breeding pr goals, what are you doing about this? And um, it's a huge work, and then as soon as you get it done, somebody from the kennel club calls you and says, it's time to start working on your update, and that's the way it is, but it's groundbreaking work. In the United States, the AKC has started a program quite recently that's called Bread with Heart, and it's a way to distinguish breeders or breed clubs that are identifying health issues in their breed, and they're defining w what it means to be a good breeder or what you need to do to produce good quality dogs. And, um, it's great that they've started this program. As you may know, it's a different setup in America. They don't, the American Kennel Club does not own the standards and, and a lot of the responsibility is with the breed clubs. 
So the AKC itself doesn't have the same kind of influence that the um, Norwegian, the Scandic clubs have, Scandinavian clubs have. It's not really quite as democratic as here. But I can say that what they're looking for from the parent clubs is either what they have written in their ethical guidelines as to what are the minimum requirements you must do as a good breeder or uh, what are the health tests that you're requiring. So in this first uh, step of the program, it's really just to list the tests that must be done. Uh, so that part's a little bit shorter than what you do in your RAS, yes. But it's great that the Americans are moving in that direction, but I think they'll benefit greatly from seeing what's being done elsewhere. And I know that there are people out in the world who really get tired of hearing, in Sweden they, in Finland they, in Norway they, but I think it's great because I think that you have the possibility to really be leaders. So we want to highlight the templates, we want to link it to the country of origin, but we want to have English excerpts so that groups that want to build a global picture for a breed can find information from many countries. And so we want to profile the great work in Scandinavia, not because we expect everybody to become like you, because many of them that's not a possibility, but it is a way to focus on health and well-being in dogs. And for the Scandinavian clubs, it's a way to show leadership. So we're looking to get um, assistance from the breed clubs in providing English excerpts for us uh, and also to help us on dog well that build up information on native breeds or other breeds that you are experts in so that uh, we get the right information on the website. Uh, the... Um, the breed database is still under construction. As I say, we want input from the breed excerpts. And one of the things that's key in here is what I said about this link to all the sources of information. So the RAS documents, breed statistics from Agria, there will be more and more breed statistics, population-based estimates coming out of the UK, and then health surveys. Uh, how many of you have participated in a health survey for your breed? Most. How many of you have helped design a health survey to be done by your breed? Quite many. How many of you were 100% satisfied with the results of that exercise? <laughs> that would be none for you out there in internet land. No, they're very challenging to do. And one of the things that we think can be done is have um, some help and some tools on the best way to do health surveys to get the data that you really want to get. I mean, even the data you've gotten now is useful. It should be compared with the other statistics and other sources of information. But there are ways to get more accurate information out of health surveys. And those methods are the same all over the world. And so if we can build up a tool section, uh, we can help people. If people can start getting more consistent format to the data, we can probably share across countries. And I think that's pretty exciting. So some of the international breed groups we're working with, I hope that's a way that, that we can also go. We're working with the international, uh, the Burner International Working Group, and there's a couple of other breeds that uh, already have international cooperations and collaborations that they think can get better by an increased focus, standardized reporting across countries, etc. And uh, so, if any of you are involved in international groups, uh, you could let us know and perhaps participate on that way. So, hopefully. In what I'm talking about, you see that we're about information, we're about collaboration, but we're really also about action. Uh, talk is great, but it's even better if something happens. And one of the other uh, efforts that the International Partnership for Dogs is involved in is the International Dog Health Workshop. The first one was in Sweden in 2012. 
and I know some of you were there, and the second one was in uh, Dortmund, Germany, and we have at both of those between 120 and 140 international people. We had at least 20 countries represented across all of the stakeholder groups, so that's very exciting. Uh, the Dortmund meeting was on Valentine's Day, uh, which was unfortunate because few people think of going to Dortmund, Germany as the most um, romantic place in the world. But we've taken care of that now and it's in Paris in April, so <laughs> what could be better? Well, talking about dogwellnet.com, our internet platform for the International Partnership for Dogs, and we have really been, we only launched in Dortmund, so the website is really only one year old. And one of the things we've done is we've been building all these resources from our partners, data information resources that they have. In September, the veterinarians in Sweden wrote an open letter to the government and all of Sweden uh, announcing that the problems in brachycephalic dogs were terrible and something had to be done about it. How many of you heard about that or knew about that? Almost everybody. And so when that happened, uh, we immediately started a new section on Dog Wellnet uh, talking about brachycephalics, so it was a hot topic. Now, we had tons of resources already online. We had lots of information on the BSI program. We had information on uh, some of the RAS documents on the affected breeds. We had some of the Swedish statistics. So it was possible for us as an arm's length organization to right away say to the media, to the internet world, there is stuff happening in these breeds. The breeders, the breed clubs, and the kennel clubs have not been ignoring these issues. They have been working on them. And we served as a resource to talk about what was going on. Also, uh, the way the letter came out from the veterinarians, um, they did say they wanted to collaborate, but it started a bit of a confrontational situation. And uh, I have seen this on many of these issues. There's a lot of finger pointing. It's the breeder's fault. It's the kennel club's fault. It's, you know, and then even as a veterinarian, I can say, well, what are the veterinarians doing about it? You know, are you doing enough? And so, of course, if we can, we would like to see collaboration and cooperation rather than blame and finger pointing. And um, one of the things that's happening is there's a... Um, brachycephalic uh, conference for aimed mainly for the breeders in Sweden this weekend. I'm speaking there as well as uh, David Sargon from one of the research groups in the UK and several other experts as well as local experts to talk about moving this forward. Now this brachycephalic meeting was planned long before this big media storm in the fall. So it's an example of work was already underway. Lots of good things were happening. There wasn't enough c communication across stakeholder groups. So we're looking forward to good things coming out of this meeting and further actions. One of the things we talk about in the hot topic area on the brachycephalic, so was new research that was out. So I'm an epidemiologist, a specialist in evidence-based medicine and critical appraisal of the literature. Looking at some of the new research that had come out, there were some, several articles from the Royal Veterinary College in the UK, Rowena Packer's work, talking about how to measure the skulls of dogs, and that the skull length and measurement could be directly related to the level of problems they had in um, respiratory problems, breathing problems, and so that information is available to everywhere, and somewhere on the internet, a media person wrote an article on it and said that excellent research from the uh, Royal Veterinary College showed that 75% of French Bulldogs suffer from brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. Do you think that's true, that 75% of French Bulldogs are clinically affected by breathing problems? Yes? No? Really not sure? Not participating in this? You haven't missed anything, people on the internet. They're all suddenly reading their papers. And 
Well, it does say that 75% of uh, French Bulldogs in their study suffered from that problem, but one thing we know about statistics, this says employee satisfaction has doubled since last year, and it has. It went from 1% to 2%. It did double. Is it good? No. The 75% of the French Bulldogs that had the problem were three out of four French Bulldogs that were participating in that part of the research. Three out of four is 75%. It was not a number that could be reflective. I mean, it could or it couldn't be, but it was not a number that measured the true incidence of the disease in the population. It just was a small, very small subgroup. They're registering something like 10,000 French Bulldogs a year in the UK. So what happened to these four dogs, we really can't be sure that's reflective of all the dogs. But it wasn't a lie either, it was taken out of a paper. But when there's these numbers, people can selectively find that one number that fits what they want to say. And so we all have to be a little aware of where the information comes from and what it means. They also in the RVC paper talk about um, that 90% uh, of the pugs that went to the RVC had BOAS. So the Royal Veterinary College is a referral hospital. They have there one of the premier surgeons in the world repairing brachycephalic problems. And so maybe it's not really shocking that a lot of the pugs that went there went there for that, right? And again, not saying it's wrong, it's true, but you had to know where the, you had to know the whole picture on the statistics to understand what it means. So the evidence that out is out there are, is scientific peer-reviewed papers, which I don't even like to read. And I know most breed breeders can't read them, or it's, it's, they get too detailed. It's challenging to get all the information you want out of the peer-reviewed literature. There's expert sources, there's opinions, there's surveys. All of these sources of data have great things about them and concerns, and we have to be able to balance that. So as I said, many of the studies that come from veterinary teaching hospitals, it's great because the experts have seen the dog, the level of diagnosis is really good. The people that are doing the work know what they're doing, but it can be a problem that these animals are sick with a specific condition out of all the sick animals that came to that hospital. And they may not have the range of age, breeds, illnesses, et cetera, that we would see in the whole population. So when we take the numbers just out of those uh, veterinary teaching hospital research papers, again, might not be getting the, the whole picture. And so in many studies, the question is, um, who makes the diagnosis? Do you know the number one cause of death for all breeds in owner-reported surveys? So it's a survey sent out to the owner of the dog. Tell me about your last dog and what he died of. The number one cause of disease in all breeds? Age. Old age, right. And I'm sure that's the owner's perspective, and it's not wrong. Of course, it's not very informative for breed work. And what it really means is the dog lived long enough that it met the owner's expectations. Doesn't really define the situation for the breed. Uh, when I was first doing the breed statistics and meeting with breed clubs and one very resistant breeder, I, and I don't even know what breed he was at the time, but he said, and who has made these diagnoses in your data? And I said, well, the veterinarians. He said, well, they don't know anything. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm not even going to argue with you, but they're kind of the best we got. <laughs> so you can't please everybody. But so um, I just actually covered this. The statistics from the veterinary teaching hospitals, great, but they may not cover the whole population. And so if I just go on from that, 
Um, the other problem with some of the research that you read is it's on very specific conditions. Uh, researchers have been known to look at the weirdest and the wildest and something really new and exciting. Um, you will see in some of the statistics when we talk about it, one of the most common causes of disease in most species is vomiting and diarrhea. How many of you have had a dog that has ever suffered from vomiting and diarrhea? <laughs> Everybody? Boring to do research, but really common. Uh, so we have to watch for that. I was at the uh, genome meeting in uh, Cambridge in June, and these are the rocket scientists of the genome world. They get their most funding from disease, studying diseases that are also important to human beings. So they study them in dogs, but they study them often because the disease in dogs is typical of an important disease in humans. There are very few of them that are working really 100% primarily from the diseases that are important to the dogs. And so what happens is they discover an association and um, Genetics R Us, the latest uh, DNA testing lab out of Outer Slobovia, instantly markets the test, and now everybody's been told that they should test their dogs for this because there's a DNA test for it. And it's not necessarily the most important in that breed, it's just available. And so we have to balance the information to decide what, is, uh, what are the tests that we're really needing to do? Because even though a lot of money has been spent to discover the association and do the testing, it's not necessarily the most important for a given breed. Any of you struggling with uh, figuring out about using DNA tests? No. You all know what to do with DNA tests. That's lucky. We could get them to write the rules. So we're all very confused. Um, when I was working with the Bernice Mountain Dog Clubs in, uh, in Finland in the summer, they're talking, are there any Bernice Mountain Dog people here? There you are. So they're talking about DM, degenerative myelopathy, which is the hot topic in Bernice Mountain Dogs. Um, three countries in Europe are now doing DM testing uh, across all their dogs in those countries. Two of those countries, they have never seen a dog with that disease. One of the countries, they think there was a bitch that had it 20 years ago, but it's like they never really confirmed it. And so when we talked to the scientists that were there, talked to them and said, why are you doing this cross the board testing for a disease that doesn't exist? There was a lot of, well, we need a baseline, and we a baseline of what, and how does this work? Ultimately, they said, you know what? It's so crazy on Facebook, we felt we had to do something. And so now I see out there what I call decision making by Facebook. How many of you think the people that are most active on Facebook are the most well-informed, well-balanced people <laughs> able to make decisions? No. OK, so that's the same all over the world as well. But I have great compassion because everybody's struggling with this. So we need better information. Um, so, uh, and then these things become the subject of media attention, media storms, whether it's in Facebook or anywhere else, and we panic and we try and respond to them. Now, probably the last time I came and talked to breeders in Norway, I'm not exactly sure when that was. How many of you saw Pedigree Dogs Exposed? Everybody, great. And you know that they talked about the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And you know that they focused on syringomyelia, which was this neurologic condition. And at that time, we already had the statistics uh, from Agria. These are from it says 2003 to six there, they're actually from 1995 to, or 1998 to 2006. You maybe don't have to be a statistician to figure out this graph. Um, <laughs> on this side are general causes of disease, mostly body systems like 
Um, digestive is here, ears, eyes, endocrine, heart, uh, injury, locomotor, various uh, body systems and processes. And it's pretty obvious that there's one cause of death here that is, this is the most common is out here. The red line is the cavalier and the blue line is all breeds of dogs. So it's pretty clear that in these data, which were for cavaliers before the age of 10 years of age, the absolute number one cause of death was heart disease. Down here we have neurologic disease. And you can see that if you talk about the length of the red line being how common it is, heart disease is way more common. However, you can see that the red line for the cavalier is longer than the blue line for all breeds of dogs. So there's no question that this breed had an increased risk of neurologic problems. They just weren't as common as the heart problems. And when I went back into the data, which I did about a minute after um, the show ended, when I saw it for the first time, uh, in the data that I had, which was 12 years of data, during that period of time, taking in any cause that might have been syringomyelia, so pain, neurologic, skull, anything that I could imagine that a veterinarian would call the seizuring that might have been syringomyelia, 21 cavaliers had died in that 12 years. How many had died of heart disease? 1,479. And so we didn't have decision-making by Facebook, but we had decision-making, or strictly by Facebook, we had decision-making by media because there was a sudden call every Cavalier club throughout the world must now have a health program for syringomyelia. And I'm not saying syringomyelia is not important, I'm just saying it's not the only problem. And so this is a perfect example to say, how do we decide what's the worst problem? Is it the most common problem? Is it the thing that affects the largest number of dogs? So that if we could fix it in some way, we would help the most dogs. Is that the most important problem or the worst problem? Or is it something where it's the highest risk? So this breed has it way more than other breeds. So it's a breed specific thing. Is it the risk thing that makes it the worst or the most important condition? Is a condition that kills an animal always the more important disease to control than one that causes chronic disease. Well, people that have maybe dogs that suffer chronic skin condition their whole life or breathing problems would say, well, it doesn't kill them, but it's no fun. Is a disease more important if it happens in animals at a younger age? Well, maybe. And are the really important problems the ones that A, we could test for so we could find them, and then we have some scheme that we could fix them or prevent them. So should we only look at really trying to work on things where we could make a difference rather than just know about it? Well, of course, there is no answer to this. There is no one right answer. It's different for every breed. It's different for every situation. It's a complex interplay that you have to think about all these issues. But you can't just run out and deal with the next thing that comes up on the media. One of the other interesting things that a breed club person said to me recently was, we figure our breeders can really only cope with two or three health problems at a time. So we're thinking of dropping hip dysplasia and elbows, because we've been doing that for a long time. This was in the Bernice again, and we'll focus on DM. And you're like, OK, maybe that's not, you know, I really understand. I'm not criticizing these people at all. It's a really tough situation. And that's where I see veterinarians and advisors, sometimes we go, yeah, that's really important. You should do something about that. Yeah, well, that's really important, too, and you should do something about that. And I'm not sure we do enough to help find that balance and find out the key issues. So that brings us back to getting the evidence, what is the right answer, and do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-
I will have a little pause while we resurrect the, the system. They say it's a security thing. Like, do you feel more secure <laughs> now that the system has gone down? 89 seconds left. 89 seconds. We're good. Not even time for a song. Um, how many of you uh, are struggling with Facebook within your clubs? I have, uh, in discussions recently, people have been telling me they're having trouble to get people to serve on committees because they're going to be attacked on Facebook. And good people are afraid to volunteer and participate. And that's a bad situation. Do you think that there is a tolerance for behavior and language on Facebook that is not tolerated in face-to-face -face meetings? Yeah. Why? But why do we tolerate it? Why don't they get you take their answers away? If anybody personally attacks somebody, why is that just not allowed? This is what amazes me. I, I don't have an answer for this, but this is what amazes me, especially in Sweden. Let's talk about Sweden because they're only on the internet. Um, <laughs> my experience with Swedes is they're so polite. At least when I'm around, they're, I'm not, and they are. And yet they're having this terrible problem on Facebook. So all these people who would never say insulting things to somebody to their face, or writing these vile things on Facebook. I don't know if it's like a, just a release of their true personality, or what is it? But we, I, I, all the clubs I've been talking to are struggling with this. And it, it's a crazy thing, but it's something we need an international strategy for, is how to manage Facebook in a way that people don't get hurt, like to encor encourage open, useful discussion without tolerating the abuse that's going on right now because uh, I'm hearing it from everywhere that people are really struggling with it. How many people think this feels more than 89 seconds? <laughs> it's coming, it's coming, yay! Thank you! Well, that's, there's good news and bad news. <laughs> if you... It says screen is starting. It's been starting for like uh, two minutes now. One more. Last one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, it flashed. Yay! We're good. Thank you. Now you can give her a round of applause. It was premature before. Anyway, this was just a funny slide on scientists disagreeing. And I want to tell you that the Swedish um, breed statistics, there's no chart that looks quite that bad. I hope. So I keep talking about the augurist statistics, the Swedish statistics, as being... Uh, a little bit different than some of the sources I've talked about. And why is that? So in the top of that rate that we're going to calculate, what we call the numerator, is still the number that we're sick or the number that we're dead by a general cause or a specific cause, whatever we're looking at. But the difference in the denominator with the insurance uh, statistics is that we have all the dogs, the healthy ones and the sick ones. So not just the ones that went to the veterinary teaching hospital or because they were sick or to the veterinarian because they were sick. We have both the healthy and the sick dogs. So in that way, we are able to track a population rate of disease if the insurance statistics in that database have the animals that are reflective of the whole population. Then we can have these population-based estimates. The Agria database, you have to remember, was not built for research. It was built to run the company and the insurance and pay the claims that everybody would be happy at about. So there's the whole amount of data, then there's some data we can use in research, and then there's a subset of data that we use 
for the breed statistics. Uh, this has increased markedly now, and I know there's at least one other person in this room who has done research on Augria breed statistics, or Augria data, and uh, so there's been lots of great research done on cats and on horses uh, and on dogs, and these have been published in the clinical literature and the veterinary um, epidemiology literature, all good papers, all interesting information, but not helpful to the breeders. But the good thing is that the database has been validated. It's also been validated to the Swedish population. Uh, one of the first things we did, this was part of Agneta Egenbal's uh, PhD thesis, was to do a survey of the Swedish dog population and compare it to um, the breed distribution in um, the Augury data and also to validate the diagnoses. And in general, it's pretty good. So just to let you know, there's about 800,000 dogs in all of Sweden. About 80% of those are purebred. About 80% of all dogs are insured. Agria Sweden has about 52% of the insured dogs, so that these statistics are on 40% of all the dogs in Sweden. So that's a massive amount, and it leads us to believe the data are fairly representative, at least sort of at that level. How many of you own a cat? How many of you like cats better than dogs? No, you can't say that, not in this room. But anyway, just because we don't want the cats to feel too badly, uh, we're also doing data on cats in Agria, but the situation is there's not only owned cats, but unowned cats. There's more unowned cats than unowned dogs in Sweden, or at least proportionally. Um, but it's still a pretty good situation one and a quarter million cats, only 10% are purebred, 36% uh, are insured, which is astronomical. It's the highest anywhere in the world. The UK is second, um, and Agria is a, a leader in the cat uh, insurance world as well. This is my graphic. This is not anatomically correct, but this would be all dogs in the United States. This would be owned dogs, and this would be insured dogs <laughs> in the United States. This this circle here is probably a little too big. At the moment, it's like in the 3%, 4% of dogs are insured in the US, so it's a totally different situation. Which means Scandinavia is special, in case you didn't know that. So we're talking about these population statistics, the number sick out of the total dog years at risk, that's a combination of the number of dogs and how long we watch them for. So they have to be insured, we have to see that they're there, we would have find out if they were sick if it happened. And we calculate two things, we calculate the rate and the risk. And the rate, how common is it? And the risk is, is the condition more or less likely in this breed compared to all breeds of dogs? And those are two different things, and we use them in slightly different ways. We hope it's a straight, clear, for, uh, clear picture, emphasizing that it's common conditions and high-risk conditions. It's not little things like nail clipping and things that are totally inexpensive, but otherwise it's the most common conditions. So let's look at an example. Let's compare two breeds that are a little bit different, Norwegian elk hound and the dog de Bordeaux. So the first thing we look at in the statistics is the overall risk. And when the blue line is for all breeds combined and the red line is for the Norwegian elk count. So the Norwegian elk count in terms of needing veterinary care, it's better than all breeds combined. Anybody surprised? I think it's a pretty healthy breed. It's a hunting breed. Do hunters take their dogs to the veterinarian the same as everybody else? Maybe not, so we might want to think about that. <laughs> but it's not death. This, this, is not, this is about veterinary care, not life insurance. So we don't have to. What do our veterinarians call the cause of death in many hunting dogs? Lead poisoning? <laughs> yeah. Well, we don't have to worry about that. Veterinary care. And now we have the dog de Bordeaux, and you have to understand that the number of dogs in this blue line, this rate, 
is exactly the same as this blue line. This is the same. This is the rate for all breeds, but I have to squinch it over here because I got to get this red line out here. Very different picture just overall in the vet care on these two breeds of dogs. This is the Norwegian elk hound, and again, we have the red line is for the Norwegian elk hound, and the blue line is for all breeds combined. The further it comes out here, it's the more common it is, and if it's a short line, it's uncommon. So we can see the longest red lines for the Norwegian elk hound are for injury, cancer is out there, and skin, but the red line's shorter than the blue line. So the Norwegian elk hound has a lower risk than all breeds. I think we'll see a fairly similar pattern for the dog to Bordeaux. Not so much. So again, these blue lines in actual amount are exactly the same as the blue line on the previous graph, but they have to be moved over to accommodate the red line uh, for the dog to Bordeaux. So you can see that locomotor problems of the muscles, bones, and joints, uh, problems of motion is the most common out here. But you can also see that for every general category of disease, the dog de, de Bordeaux has a higher rate of disease than all dogs, all breeds put together. It's a very different pattern of disease between two breeds of dogs. The other way we display the statistics in the Augria stats is we drop this line, a risk of one, that's the risk in all breeds of dogs. Then we have these red lines saying how much more at risk is it compared to all breeds. And so you see the top two, lo locomotor, which was the most common cause of uh, vet care in the dog to Bordeaux, about four times more than all breeds of dogs. And we also have this urinary tract, upper urinary tract, so kidney, also four times as high. Although, <laughs> ahem, um, <laughs> says green is on. Well, it does say that. Okay, it's back. She's starting to hit the screen with much more authority, I can tell you. <laughs> starting to get a little bit tired of it. So just to finish off with this, you get an S, this is not nearly as common, but it's extremely high risk. This is both common and high risk. And so that's how you can pull information together for a breed. Let's look at two more breeds. And now if we look at overall, these are kind of similar. They're both at increased risk for needing veterinary care compared to all breeds of dogs at about a similar rate for the Cavalier and the German Shepherd. Similar overall rates of veterinary care. When we look at them in risk compared to all breeds, we see that in the German Shepherd, uh, immunological problems, repro problems, skin problems, increased risk, but not as bad as the um, dog to Bordeaux. But when we drill down into specific causes of disease, we start to see some uh, significant risks. And I'll talk about that in a minute. In the Cavalier, here we have this one really big one right up on top is heart and then eyes and then neurologic. So still conditions where they're at say, quite significant increased risk compared to all breeds of dogs. But again, a very different pattern. So the German Shepherd dog has increased risk for quite a number of specific causes. So when we go from those general causes like immune problems, heart problems, eye problems, um, they have pancreatic problems in the digestive system. They have numerous locomotor problems like OCD, hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, numerous problems under the immune system and also in the skin. And again, for the CKC, the, the Cavalier, 
it's mostly heart, eyes, and neurologic. So again, when we look at both general and specific causes, there's quite a difference between breeds. Now, I know most of you are working within your breed, but as we move forward, it's important to put breeds in the context of other breeds as well, I think. So what happens if we talk about certain conditions, pyometra, uh, stop me if you need, uh, the, I used to know that in Swedish, leave murder in flammerhund. and uh, epilepsy, diabetes, injury, they're common in all breeds. I, I have a friend who does, uh, or a colleague who does some stuff, he says wolves probably had these, some of these conditions. So sometimes dogs get sick with something, could even be common just because it's a dog. But where we see those red lines way longer than the blue lines, then it's having a condition because it's a specific breed. So Springer Spaniels have an increased risk of pyometra and mammary tumors. Several hunting breeds have an increased risk of diabetes beyond the average. Uh, hunting breeds, mixed breeds have an increased risk of injury. And all that might be due to actual genetic conditions in the breed or it might be due to other factors. So, but for those conditions, it's a breed specific increased risk because it's that breed. And of course, it's the same in people. People have uh, related to what they do or where they live or where they came from. It's not just genetics, it's different things. But how do we decide what's most important to work on? Why would we want to know about this stuff? Well, I'll give you a quick example in the Sheltie. And the Sheltie is a relatively healthy breed. You can see that most of its red lines don't go beyond the blue lines, so it's breed risk. For example, here for reproductive problems, mostly pyometra, the risk is exactly the same. So they're quite common to get, it's quite common that Shelties get pyometra, but because they're a dog, not because they're a Sheltie. One of the things that they discovered in this relatively healthy breed was down here, Kidney problems, not common, fairly short line, but almost twice the increased risk of kidney disease in the Sheltie compared to other breeds of dogs. And when they saw this at first, they said, we've never heard of kidney disease in the Sheltie. There must be something wrong with your statistics. Of course, I said, of course not, couldn't be. But they started to do this research and they found a few reports in the literature and online of kidney problems in Shelties. And part of the reason it hasn't been well reported is it's not recognized as a syndrome by veterinarians. So even in our data, it's called nephritis, nephrosis, kidney disease unspecified, some sort of kidney disease. As I say, kidney disease on the left, kidney disease on the right. And it's only when we put it all together and say the veterinarians didn't know exactly what it was, but they said this was a kidney problem, that it rose. Now, do they want to panic? No, they don't want to panic, but they can say, let's keep an eye on this. And one of the things that they did was um, see if they could identify some researchers who were interested in kidney disease, start looking for these cases in the Shelties and try and better define what was going on. So that was the way in, in this breed of saying, okay, it's interesting to know for the sake of knowing, but it's more interesting to know for the sake of doing something. We don't have to mount a whole health control program in Shelties, but we could keep an eye on it. And as I say, overall, keep in mind it's a relatively healthy breed. We don't have to panic here, but we can still use these statistics in relatively healthy breeds. So statistics, statistics, statistics. It's okay if you look like this. It's not okay if you look like this. <laughs> this, of course, would be the people at home on the internet because they can sit in that position while they're listening. So the whole point behind the breed profile project and updates was a response to the breeders asking for information and a goal to get the data in the right form into the people who could make the right decision. So people like you, people like breeders. And there was three sets. There was 1990 to 5 to 2002. We did the breed profiles, and they were on CDs. Some of you may have seen them or received one. 
and then a first set of updates, and the most recent updates, which is 2006 to 2011, which Agria, ha Agria Norway has been giving out to the breed clubs when they ask for them. It's six years of data, and it's over 120 breeds. And the key thing here is the dog is only counted once over the six-year period for any category or specific diagnosis that we looked at. When we did the first set of breed profiles, we did them yearly. And then none of you would do this, but some people are in denial about health, and then they said, well, this is the same dogs. The same dogs are sick every year. It's only a handful of dogs, but it's the same dogs every year. And in fact, it's something that we know with veterinarians, when they count cases of disease, they count them on how many times they see a dog of a certain breed or a condition. They can't do the stats in their head that it's an individual dog um, over time, or whether it's one dog or a lot of dogs. To some extent we do, but to some extent we can't be very accurate. So then when we turned around, we said, okay, we'll make conservative estimates. So these dogs, for the whole period of time they're insured, they could go to the veterinarian 20 times for a skin problem, but they can't count it once as a skin problem. Now, if they have four types of skin disease within those categories, they get counted again. But they're conservative estimates, and they're really better estimates of breed risk in that way. And so then the breed clubs can use them to understand the risk of disease and death in their breed compared to other breeds. It's mainly a comparison thing. Identify what we've been talking about, the most common problems and the r highest risk problems within the breed, putting that together with other information to say, well, which are the worst problems? And of course, to educate current and future puppy buyer buyers. So. The fact that I said the Shelties were pretty common to get Pymetra wasn't high risk for the Sheltie compared to other breeds, but it's a common problem. So if you were selling a puppy, especially to someone who didn't know, maybe it was their first dog, you'd say, this is a common condition, this is how you might recognize it, this is what you have to watch out for. And of course, ultimately, we hope they're used to design um, prevention and monitoring programs. So I'm on and on about it's got to be population-based, we've got to have rates, we've got to have risk. Why is this so important? Talking about the way we talk about numbers. Cancer neoplasia is one of the top four causes of death in all breeds combined. Everybody knows cancer is common. And this was in these statistics, which the older statistics were mostly dogs before 10 years of age. Berner Sanenhund, Golden Retriever, Flat Coated Retriever. You know these breeds. For each one of them, the number one specific kind or relatively specific kind of cancer that they died of before 10 years of age was lymphosarcoma, l various kinds of lymphoid cancer, probably in the burners that includes the histio, etc. So it's the same, right? It's the same in these three breeds. All three breeds have this high risk of lymphosarcoma as a cause of death before 10 years of age. Only this is the actual risk. Number one cause of death before 10 years of age, but a heck of a lot more Bernese dying, lots of flat coats, hardly any goldens compared to all breeds of dogs. So the issue is, even though it's the number one cause, it doesn't tell you the, the whole picture. And in the early statistics, we calculated these uh, life curves of how long dogs lived. And you see that over 80% of golden retrievers were alive up to five years of age, and still about 80% of them were still alive at 10 years of age. So they didn't die a lot before 10 years of age, but the, of those that died, the most common cause was lymphosarcoma. How will this look in the flat coat? It'll look like that. So now the same over 80% survived to five, but by 10 years of age, it's uh, maybe 
60% to 50% are still alive at 10 years of age. So this number one cause due to cancer, boom, they're dying at a higher rate. And the Bernese, it's like this. So at five years of age, uh, a lower percentage, only just over 80% are alive at five years of age and only 30% are alive at 10 years of age. So even when you get the same number, it's not always the same pattern in different breeds. So what do we do with all this information? Dog de Bordeaux looks like this, and the Bernese Mountain Dog looks like this, and the Sheltie looks like this. What's okay or not okay? What's an okay rate of disease or a bad rate of disease? What's too much? How do we make that decision? And who makes that decision? Well, you all know if you sit back and do nothing, the government or the media or somebody else is going to make that decision. It's one of the reasons that the good kennel clubs try to be proactive. One of the things, as I told you, this is a great, this is a great thing about having um, graduate students in multiple disciplines. I learned the term anticipatory guidance. It's called giving people advice and knowing what to look for when. So at various ages, what, what issues might come up, what diseases might be the most common. Things to watch out for based on the breed, based on the age, based on the environment. So that's good to know. The other thing we have to consider in all this is the influence of expectations. So say you had a dog, an eight-year-old dog, Three different people had eight-year-old dogs in these three breeds, and they got cancer. Same, eight-year-old dog, they got cancer, it's the same. No, people at home, they're shaking their head. They're saying no. People at home are asleep ages ago. I don't know why I'm talking to them. No, of course it's not the same, because at eight years old, in this breed, the Irish Wolfhound, it's already an old dog, old-ish at least. And in these two breeds, you think, no, it's still a young dog. At eight, it shouldn't be getting cancer. So in our head, already we have this different way that we process these numbers based on our expectation for how long the dog should live. So the influence of expectations is the same. So now we got the same breed. We get one that gets cancer at six and one that at 14. Is it the same? Is it the same impact on the owner? Is it the same importance to the breed? No, of course not, because at 14, the dog is getting old. Most of us believe you have to die of something. It becomes kind of okay at, at a certain age. And we start thinking, at six, that's too soon. It's not okay. But, of course, what we know over time is we've changed in our head what's okay and not okay. I mean, we all think it's okay for giant breed dogs to die at nine or 10 years of age, but we don't really know when we decided that. I mean, we accept it because it's common. Is it okay? Well, it is what it is. But some of these breeds, and the Bernese Mountain Dog is one of them, it's becoming younger and younger and younger and younger, and it's less and less surprising for the dog to die at a younger age. Then you get into this thing, well, if it had a great life and died young, Maybe that's okay, but if it was sick all the time and died young, it's not okay. But it's just to show you this, there's no simple answers to what's okay and not okay. But it's important that we keep into the bigger picture, not only the dog, but the owner. Because I read things online all the time where somebody buys a dog of a certain breed Maybe they bought it to grow up with their child so they would grow old together. They were not old together, but they grow up together and they'd be friends. And the dog dies at a long, young age and now they're so traumatized they're never getting another dog and they're recommending to other people never get a dog of this breed. Well, better to have good expectations. If the breed, if this dog of this breed is unlikely to live to an old age, better they know that before they get it. And then there's all this stuff about Health and welfare, what's the definition, what's good health and what's good welfare? I'll draw these two comparisons, top causes of death in two breeds, German Shepherd, locomotor, skin, skin, cancer, Yemptund. <laughs> different, 
different major causes of disease in those two breeds of dogs. What are we going to do about them? I, I don't really know how to prevent all these. These are quite complex diseases. I know how to prevent this. This is very easy. You just keep the dog on a leash. You keep him in the kennel. You never let him run free. You're good to go. You could especially not do this <laughs> with the dog. But of course, in a hunting country like Norway, you go, it's a hunting dog takes its chances. It, you know, Drevers in Sweden, they get, uh, in North America, they find this hilarious. I mean, it's like killed by moose, eaten by bear, <laughs> you know, doesn't happen over there. But at some level, most of you think, well, it's kind of okay. It's a hunting dog. Um, and in some countries, they would be okay, in other countries, less okay. But we make these decisions all the time. This is a high-risk activity. Veterinary students, what is happening in the next 20 seconds? We're probably having a cruciate ligament rupture. It's a good chance. No. It's a healthy dog. It won't get sick. But this dog is at high risk for injury. Do we go to the owner and say, you're a bad owner. You have dogs who are at high risk of disease. You're a bad, bad owner kind of think it's okay. It's kind of cool that they want to do extreme fr frisbee with their dog. That's kind of cool. We look at this. Is this a lovely afternoon with your dogs? No, it is not. It is subjecting your dogs to ear problems and skin infections and broken <laughs> teeth. So you are putting your dog at high risk. It's preventable. Keep them in the house. No toys, because <laughs> they could be bad. So we have these different risks that we look at and the what's okay and not okay and genetic and otherwise. So what's one of the n biggest things, hot topic now about a non-genetic condition making dogs sick all over the world, and that's obesity, right? Now, one of the problems that I have is these pictures are all over the internet. They're on funniest home videos. There's fat dogs on their back, and they're, they're throwing their legs around. And it's funny, but of course it's not funny, right? It's the animal's having an issue. Where do we draw the line? Where does cute and funny, and I love my dog, so I'm giving him, him pancakes with butter when do we draw the line that that's not okay anymore and now we've created a welfare problem? We were having a discussion earlier about how maybe what we have to do with some of these affected breeds like the brachycephalics and stuff is treat them as special needs dogs. As long as you don't take them out in the heat and you don't make them walk too fast and you don't make them exercise too much and you don't let them get fat, maybe they're kind of okay. And is that okay, that we have special needs dogs, that they're very challenged unless we treat them specially? Well, I have an increasing uh, compassion for dogs that get old and lame, because I am heading in that direction. So, um, But again, if I have this problem, that would be my own problem. The dog has it, it's somebody else's uh, fault. So when we look at these brachycephalic breeds, this is for pugs. This is increased risk compared to all breeds in the yellow line for things like um, upper respiratory problems, entropion, which is the folding in of the eyelids. So we have eyes, 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 breathing, breathing, uh, and then a little couple other things at the end. When is it not okay? When is it too much? And then, of course, this is the actual risk compared to other breeds. It's not telling us how common it is, but does that matter? Is it the problem is that the dog has such increased risk? So if we look at the commonness in the pug, eyes is out here really common. Upper respiratory problems aren't as, prob as common, but still super high risk, and skin. 
and what's the most important. We tend to have a belief that it's a good thing to be able to breathe, and it's a really bad, bad thing not to be able to breathe. And so we tend to think that breathing is kind of really important. But then eyes, if you've ever had a corneal ulcer, it wasn't fun. It was a lot of pain. And so, again, it's juggling the commonness and the increased risk. And then the most important thing is, could we do something about it? Could we breed these dogs in a way that they didn't suffer as badly from as many problems, or as many of them didn't suffer as badly, whichever way uh, we put that together? And that becomes an important way of looking at it. I got quite a number of uh, pictures at one time off a site that's called the funnydogsite.com. And of course, it's not really funny, right? This is a smart dog. This dog is sleeping with its head up on the rail, probably because if it puts its head down, it can't breathe or it's going to pass out. This dog is obese on top of being severely compromised in the respiratory system. So we tend to think breathing is pretty important, and that's kind of not a question of is it OK or not OK. It's not OK not to be able to breathe. Um, I think it's 7.30, and as opposed to what I told everybody I was going to do and where I told everybody I was going to have a break, I think I'm going to change my mind, <laughs> because I can. <laughs> and I think we will, at this point, take a breather and uh, I think there's coffee and um, obesity-provoking um, <laughs> treats out in the hall. We'll take a 20-minute break. And please join me, and we'll sum up, and we'll look at Norwegian numbers when you come back. We'll look at some Norwegian statistics. We're back, and... Um, We'll just pick up where we left off. If you recall, a lot of this is about how do we determine what's the best, what's the worst disease, what do we do about it, how do we define the worst, the worst breed or the worst disease or the worst condition, um, how do we try to get this big picture balance. So this, these are a bit busy graphs, but I'll just show them to you because we've been starting to look at a little bit at death. So everything I've showed you to now has been about veterinary care, and this is about from the life insurance or, or death. And this uh, line here in the middle is the rate of death before 10 years of age. Well, it's a little after 10 years of age, but uh, death in all breeds, and this green line uh, was the rate of death in mixed breeds of dogs from the Agria data. And you can see out here that, in, and I've taken away from this all the giant breeds, okay, the St. Bernards and the Irish Wolfhounds and the giant breeds that we know die at relatively young ages and have therefore fairly high rates of dying. So just for comparative pur purposes, I've taken out the giant breeds. So these are not the top worst breeds in all the breeds with dying, um, these are everybody except the giant breeds of dogs. So you see out here that the English Bulldog, very high rate of death, and the first four there are Irish Bulldog, King Charles Spaniel, German Shepherd Dog, Kerry Blue Terrier, Boxer, Japanese Chin, Flat-Coated Retriever, and then we get into some other breeds here. Here's Pug, almost at the same level as all breeds. Quite a few terriers out here at the lower levels of death and out by the mixed breeds, some of the terriers and smaller toy breeds of dogs, which isn't shocking to you in terms of thinking that small dogs often live quite long. But you can see some of the brachycephalic breeds in here uh, have pretty high rates of death. And then you say, well, what does that mean? They're dying, they're dying uh, more than other breeds of dogs. And we like to put that together with the age at death. So here we have uh, the French Bulldog, 
uh, the dogs that died were at quite a young age, and same with the um, English bulldog and the pug. And the statistics aren't always the easiest to see because these ones are not age-adjusted, or, or we can age-adjust the age of death, but you have things happening like mixed-breed dogs have a very low rate of death before 10 or 12 years of age, but the ones that die can die at quite a young age of death. And if we went back and looked at the statistics, we would see they're mainly dying of injury, getting hit by car or whatever. And of course, um, I have a friend who's a Jack Russell Terrier breeder who says getting hit by a car is a genetic disease in the Jack Russell Terrier. <laughs> So it's, it's sometimes challenging to determine what's going on here, but I think if you can pick out breeds that both have a high rate of death compared to all breeds and are dying at a relatively young age, then you put that together and say, hmm, that might be something we want to look at. So just talking about balancing all the sources of information. So when it comes down to it, is there any such thing as a perfectly healthy animal or breed that has no risk of di disease? And th of course not. And um, as much as I think many good things have come out after pedigree dogs exposed, the most um, inflammatory things you see, it's like dogs should never get sick and they should never die, and any time they do, it's a terrible thing and it's the breeder's fault. Well. No, there's some kind of normal level of illness. And um, one of my colleagues says, if we could get rid of the top five causes of death in dogs, then there'd be a different top five causes of death in dogs, right? I mean, there would always be this. And so we have to be careful that we define this complicated situation of what's the worst, what are we going for, what about it, is it health and welfare, um, and, and keep this big picture in mind so that we don't, don't get distracted just by um, emotional situations. So, and then we say, can we monitor the health of our dog populations over time with an aim to maintain and improve the health of individuals? Well, as Trina said at the beginning, that's what you have been doing. And uh, the kennel clubs in Norway, Finland, and Sweden have been providing tools to the breed clubs to know about numbers of dogs. And uh, together with some of the statistics we get from Agria and all the other information, you have been trying to monitor. It's very hard to monitor over time and see the exact differences in populations because there's so many factors at play. And that's a challenge. But you're doing what you can to at least be open and honest about the issues. What's great about the breed uh, profiles and updates from Agria is that it's a collaborative partnership between the insurance company, the experts, the breeders, the kennel club, and veterinarians and researchers. And uh, I know that many uh, countries Kennel clubs, breed clubs are dealing with the issues of the brachycephalic dogs. And into this mix of partners, we need to bring some of the government agencies uh, and some other groups. But if we care about the, the wellness of the dogs, it's about working together because nobody can do it on their own. So the, the breed updates, that's a great thing. They're a real partnership. They provide practical information. So it's not at the highest level of science uh, as some of the papers that we've published, and it's, but it's presented in a way that people can see it and it's impactful. And it's very helpful in that way. And um, when combined with other information, you get this idea of this picture. So it's, it's simplified. The original breed profiles have a lot more information on age and gender and different issues, but we've brought it down to sort of simple principles for this. As I said, it's population-based and it's Swedish dogs, but it is interesting in other countries because the point is to say, why would I think my population of purebred dogs is different than the population in Sweden? And there could be good reasons. But what evidence do I have to show that that is true? 
So do I uh, have evidence that proves that my breed is very different than the lions in Sweden or the type of dog in Sweden? And do I have evidence that these diseases reported in the Swedish dogs don't occur in my breed? If you don't have evidence that they're different, chances are they're more the same than different. But that's where we want to move forward and bring in health survey information and any other information, just see what's going on. And when I finish with the summary on the main part of the talk, I'm going to present some comparison statistics for Norway and Sweden that show some similarities and some differences, and uh, hopefully we have a bit of a discussion about that. And then hopefully this stimulates research and sharing from other groups, um, and this is both uh, within the dog world and outside. I had several emails today from a woman who's working on uh, fibrotic respiratory disease and working in West Highland White Terriers, and there's an international veterinary and human medicine collaborative group working on um, fibrotic disease and looking in dogs and humans and actually using some of the statistics from Sweden to look at some of these issues. And then it gets kind of exciting to think that um, we can inform uh, health not only in dogs but in people for those conditions where it applies. But mostly I'm about the dogs. People, whatever. Uh, so, but there are cautions, okay? So, like any piece of information, and I've shown you a couple, somebody can grab one little piece of information, take it out of context, use it to pr prove their point, and so you have to be careful. It has to be looked at in the context of insurance statistics in Sweden and the breed and how we've measured and how we've calculated the statistics. So it can be used, but there needs some kind of context around it. And that's why Agria has, uh, in general, uh, they are eventually going to give these um, breed updates to the world. But they're trying to start and let the Scandinavian breed clubs deal with them first. So that the health committees get them first, look at the information, then if their members ha get it, then they're ready to answer questions. They're ready to put it in the context of the other work that they have done um, before we unleash it on the public. But as we talked about with the internet, and the more I talk about these things, and everybody takes pictures with their cell phones, it's, you know, soon everywhere anyway. So we see how it goes. Um, there's always a way to misinterpret the material. There's always a way to try and say the material supports your own personal opinion. But in my experience working with breed clubs, when you start getting these things down, these big red lines and the little blue lines, um, you have a point to talk about. And then you can get the people that are in denial to not just deny it because they feel in their bones that the breed is not sick, but to start looking for inform good information and evidence. Uh, if it's different, fine, but it has to be based on more than just your personal opinion. And it goes for the veterinarians as well with the brachycephalic issue. We're really trying to encourage the veterinarians to keep track and get numbers and talk about not just to say, oh, we see so many sick, what's it? It's like, well, how many is so many? And uh, everybody to get a little bit more quantitative so that we're talking about the same issues. Um, with the Swedish, uh, with the insurance statistics, what's there really happened? Um, barring misdiagnosis by the veterinarians, uh, if it's not there, if the owner has to recognize that the dog has a problem, take it to the veterinarian in order for it to be diagnosed and treated for a problem. And again, in the brachycephalics, we know there's a problem where people think it's normal uh, for a pug to make breathing noises, they don't associate that with a sick dog. And so some of these conditions may be underrepresented to veterinarians. But again, when we have over six years of data, say we have a long time when the dog is insured, um, if the dog gets into a clinical problem, it should be caught in the data. And if it never gets to a clinical stage, maybe it's not that bad. But then again, we're back to okay, not okay, and who sets the line. Moving ahead in Norway, which is part of the reason I'm here, 
um, both terms of moving ahead with the insurance statistics, but also with you cooperating with the International Partnership for Dogs and Dog Wellnet. I understand that about 30 clubs have received the breed updates, so that means there must be 80 or 90 clubs who have not, because there's that many. And um, uh, Christian and his team at Agria uh, Norway are happy to share the information, um, but rather than unleash it on the whole public, they're waiting for people to ask and show an interest. And then maybe with the Kennel Club, we've talked today about uh, uh, encouraging breed clubs to incorporate that information together with all their other information than they're asked. So, um, so that's hopefully the way to go. And of course, you need some support in looking at the information and moving ahead. I'm giving them out, and uh, we're giving them out starting this spring in Finland. As I said, Agria has just. Uh, s is starting up this spring in Finland, and then the Finns are quite keen to beat out the Swedes. And uh, I hope the Norwegians are also keen to do a better job than the Swedes uh, and the Finns, I hope. And so you can all have this healthy uh, competition uh, about looking at the data. And then with the International Partnership for Dogs and DogWellNet.com, we look forward to an ongoing partnership with the Norwegian Kennel Club. We look forward to helping international breed groups and uh, individual breed clubs to help us improve the presence of the breed on DogWellNet. Uh, if you have information on health surveys that's available, we're happy to link it to our information on the breed. Um, talking to some of you about specific groups you're involved with and how we can support you and, and you can have information uh, on the website. It's not just about information on the website. It's not just Google for dogs. We also want to build community. So we have the ability to arrange sort of working groups or international forums where people can discuss on the website, either in private or public, um, either free comments or moderated um, to support these international discussions. And especially in smaller number breeds of dogs, I think it's really important to reach out to the uh, international community to get that um, force going with, uh, with what's happening. My husband was commenting, I'm wearing my uh, ISIC pin, which is the International uh, Icelandic Sheepdog Club pin. And he said, will they recognize it? And I said, I doubt it unless there's an ISIC member here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great pin. He said, will they be offended? And I said, well, then they have to give me jewelry from their breed. <laughs> and I'll wear it. And so then he was imagining me unable to stand up because I had, I'll deal with it. I'll get a bigger jacket. Uh, so I hope that'll go on. Now, this is where I was going to break, and we've already broken. And um, I'm going to pause for a minute and try and get a little bit of questions and discussion, and then we're going to carry on, and um, uh, I think we'll keep streaming, and we'll just see if I suddenly realize I've put up something terribly inflammatory. I'll just stop at that point. Any questions or comments? Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and we have the health day where uh, all kinds of uh, businesses and uh, scientists came and, and kind, of, uh, kind of sell all kinds of DNA tests uh, to us. That is going to be the next big thing. How to handle uh, this, uh, these uh, problems that we haven't had in our dogs ever. Because I think they were, were uh, narrowing the gene pool uh, in our breeds Yes, it is. And I have to repeat your question for the recording. Uh, basically, it was about uh, at this wonderful Bernie's Mountain Dog Symposium in Finland, there was a number of scientists talking about new tests. Um, 
sometimes with totally opposing opinions on which were the good tests and the not good tests. And she's saying, how do we make these decisions about these DNA tests? Because of course you risk narrowing the gene pool in a breed like the Bernese Mountain Dog that already has significant problems. And what are we gonna do about this? And so the easy answer is, I don't know. The longer answer is, um, one of the things we're trying to do as part of the uh, standardized reporting project, even with the Bernese, is to find out what people are testing for and to get numbers from different places, to get people to quantify all the diseases in the breed, okay? All the problems, whether or not they have a test of any kind or a DNA test or whatever, to get people to build a matrix so they really see what are the important issues in their breed. I was just talking to someone else about boxers and saying that it's now becoming common that people say, well, if we don't have a DNA test for it, it must not be inherited. <laughs> right, and it's a very scary swing now that people think that if it's DNA, it's right, and that is not true. There are a lot of DNA tests that are detecting something. They are not necessarily detecting the cause of the disease in a given breed. Uh, so it's not infallible. And just because a DNA test exists, it's not necessarily the important condition for the breed. One of the things we have been trying to do is to build an expert panel on dog wellnet where the people developing the tests experts in the field, genetic advisors, would come together collectively to look at reports of new tests or existing tests and say, first of all, is it a valid test based on how it was researched? And then, has it been marketed? Is it got adequate quality? And then, how does it fed, fit into the genetic counseling for an individual breed? Because the other problem is, just because it works in one breed doesn't mean it works in all breeds. And quite honestly, it's an area I'm extremely challenged with because all the experts say, yes, yes, this is what we need. All the breeding advisors in the kennel clubs say, yes, yes, this is what we need because they get a dog and it's coming in from somewhere else in Europe and it's tested negative on a certain test from a lab they've never heard of. And of course the breeder wants the animal accepted as free of the disease. It's a really huge area of challenge. Everybody says it's important and they want to help. I'm having trouble motivating the experts to actually do it. Part of the reason is almost every expert that is involved in developing genetic tests has a link with a lab. And I'm, they're good people. I mean, a lot of them are really good people, but they are in a position of a slight conflict of interest. Many of the labs, some of them that are quite good, are in litigation against each other for who stole whose patent and who's selling it and they're selling it for cheaper and whatever. And then they become afraid to say anything in public on the line because it will be used against them or whatever. So it's a hugely complex situation. And if anybody has any better ideas, let me know. If you know an expert, we're gonna try and you know, continue to put pressure on them. The, there's some excellent resources. The World Small Animal Veterinary Association and the University of Pennsylvania have this PenGen, and it's a long list of tests and breeds and where you can get them tested. Um, some information on quality, but not enough to really advise people. One of the other projects we're, think, we're working on on IPFD is summer student projects with veterinary students because we want veterinarians involved more. And when I talk to veterinary audiences, pure veterinary audiences, and I start talking about the newer geno genomic and genetic information, which I'm not an expert in, but I can show them cool slides on it. <laughs> and then I say, do you feel you're competent to advise your clients on 
breeding information, and most of them just say, no way. I mean, I'm lucky if I can go and look what kind of blood I have to take and where do I send it and how much does it cost. And so it's not to blame the veterinarians that they're not more involved in genetic counseling, but it's to say, how do we do this in the future to build a good community where, where we can do this? So I don't know. I don't know how we can be, everybody says this is one of the most important areas that we have to deal with and it's a real challenge. I will ask Christian, but they, they in, as my understanding, in most of Augria, every dog is covered for at least one. So it's the understanding that any dog of any breed could need an emergency cesarean section. In most breeds, they don't cover two or more. Aha, uh -huh. depends on the insurance range and that sort of thing. Um, there are limits on it for various reasons, and I will actually show you in some of the Norwegian statistics, it's a, one of the things that's different between Norway and Sweden. I didn't repeat the question. The question was, <laughs> does Augria cover for cesarean sections? And the answer is yes, but a limited number depending on the insurance and a little bit depending on the breed. You have a situation in Norway that people say they live far, far away from the veterinarian, and so they want to plan uh, routine or, or planned C-sections. So again, it's a little bit complex. What we have is at least the first number, and so for breeds at high risk, where f many of them need cesareans, that comes out in the statistics, but the full number m maybe doesn't come out. Other questions, comments? We'll carry on and look at some of this uh, finished data. Now, for everyone out in internet land and everyone here, this next section is very, it, it's some of the Swedish insurance uh, information, but it's some new data that I've taken out of a database uh, from 2009 to 2013. Uh, it's preliminary data. I don't want it shared widely. I'll deny it if you bring it back to me. Uh, and I was going to stop screening, but I think we'll let it go. And uh, it's not really, you know, nuclear missile codes. So we should be okay, but we'll see how we go. Oh, I'm not even there yet. I'm just at the summary. So I've got three summary slides, and then we'll go into the Norwegian data. One of the things that I er realized early on is I don't know what a dog is. There's so many different by breeds. We have to look at this across breeds. But I absolutely believe from a human-animal interaction point of view, the range in breeds is wonderful. People like different breeds of dogs. The diversity in dogs enriches our life, and it's the wrong thing to say get rid of it. And it's a wrong thing to blame all purebred dogs for the problems of a limited number of them. I was uh, having interaction with uh, a journalist from USA Today last weekend who was writing an article to coincide with Westminster. And she, I was able to get her to write about the BSI program here in Scandinavia and the Health Watch program in um, the UK. And she said, well, there's problems in English Bulldogs, and there's problems in German Shepherds, and there's problems. She's listing these breeds off, and of course, in a journalistic way, she says, and the list of problem breeds goes on and on and on. With at least only three ons, but still. And I said to her, now you're writing this for Westminster, and I said, you need to remember that people are going to see a lot of lovely, healthy dogs running around that ring. In BSI right now, it's 39 high-risk breeds, and in the breed watch in the UK, it's 12. That doesn't mean all the other 300 breeds are perfectly healthy, but they're also not deemed to be at super high risk. 
And uh, so there's so many breeding things that purebred dogs have, uh, whether it's hunting or uh, scent uh, abilities. I know I'm talking to people who agree with me on this. We don't want to throw everything out. And one of the problems out in the world is it's become this purebred dog sick. And it's like some purebred breeds, some dogs of purebred breeds have quite a few problems, no question but it's not all of them. So we have to do what we can to also promote the healthy breeds. And I'm happy to say, I don't have anything to do with, with dog shows and it's not for me to comment, but I just happened to say that it was an absolutely gorgeous German short-haired pointer who took best in breed at Westminster. So I'm happy that it wasn't a breed that I will have to talk to a lot of reporters about. So, and then just as a reminder what I said, the effect of chronic disease and early death on people is a problem. It's a significant owner, uh, effect on the owner and family. So we need to have appropriate expectations. So we need to be transparent about the issues in these breeds. And you know all about this. You know you have a focus on education and responsibility. And so we have to take into effect into our minds, societal and attitudinal changes, changes in veterinary care, changes in the business world of the veterinary uh, world, um, and society and media influence. As hard as it is, we have to take this big picture view. Um, and then this is let's all work together. Let's work together through IPFD, through your kennel clubs and everything. So that's why it was going to be a big finish for the streaming, but I'm going to keep going now. So, And then there's no final on that. Whoops. So switching gears a little bit here, data from Norway, Agria Norway, data from Agria Sweden. The number of dogs insured in Agria is relatively small. No, based on the number of insured dogs, and it's also a smaller proportion of the Norwegian dog population. It's newer. So the dogs in Norway that are insured as a population are younger on average than the ones in Agri Sweden. Like I said, that's been going on for decades and decades and decades and decades. The Swedish population is much more stable. So there's lots of reasons why we would see different things in the statistics from Norway than Sweden. So it is my ongoing joy to find ways of looking at the data that take into account all these differences. And then there is the comparison group. In Sweden, um, amongst the insured dogs now, it's 25%? Uh, I'm asking you. There's a lot of mixed breed dogs in the Swedish data. It's, it's not quite that high in most of the statistics I show you. There aren't that many mixed breed dogs insured in Agria, Norway. So the comparisons I've made here, I just take um, purebred dogs. I'm not sure whether or not they're registered, but I take the purebred dogs and compare them. And so one of the ways I said was, well, what about the, these general causes of disease? How do they look between Sweden and Norway? So I ranked them out and I looked at them and you can see that in these color-coded groups that I've put, the ranking in Sweden and Norway is very similar. So this is the top, the top cause, general causes of veterinary care, digestive system, number one in both. And then the next four, two, three, four, five, four, two, three, five. So the top five are the same. The next four are essentially the same. The next four, the next five, and the next four. So pretty similar, at least in terms of the general causes of disease between Norway and Sweden across all breeds. And why should it be really different? I mean, we really don't expect, as much as you're special, we don't think it should be that different.
as I said, these are very, um, I think, these are very preliminary data, um, but I hope that they relate to you that there's more similarities than differences, I think, between Norway and Sweden. I also want to tell the scientific community here that the data from Norway are not nearly as robust as the data from Sweden. I mean, it's a longer, we've had the data set a lot longer, the population is different, and it's been related to the Norwegian population. So jumping in and thinking that we can do the same research, all these fantastic research projects that we've done on the Swedish database can be repeated on the Norwegian insurance database, it, it's just not the case. I mean, there may be certain pieces of it that we could pull out and use effectively, but there's also a lot of risks. So as much as Augury would like to support that, there's challenges, but I mean, if there's specific issues or problems, I mean, they would be considered on a, on a one-off basis, I think. So I think that um, with that, I'm going to ask for more questions. Participants, um, my uh, email is brenda.bonnet, B-O-N-N-E-T-T, -T, at IPF dogs.com and you can get it through the kennel club or whatever if you have a breed club or a breed international breed group and you want to participate with us um, we'd be interested to hear from you dogwellnet.com is open to the public there's very much you can see from the public right now you cannot sign on as a member we are taking members from breed and health clubs to help us build the website but I can also tell you probably within the month you can sign on and be an actual member. And then those of you that could do more work with us could become quote unquote advanced members. So I'm really looking forward to continue to work with you in Norway and um, these common problems and needs and goals. And with that, I think we could end the streaming. <laughs>